Hello, this is Lee Matney of the Linda Matney Gallery in Williamsburg, Virginia. This program is a revised and enhanced version of the Zoom event from last Friday with Kent Knowles. Cultural influencer Jeff Maisie of Vera Magazine has said of Kent Knowles, Sometimes a painting will catch your eye from a distance and hook the viewer by the ribcage. I understand that sentiment very well when I see the work of Kent Knowles, professor of art at Savannah College of Art and Design, Atlanta. We have represented Kent at the gallery for nearly a decade, and today we're talking about painter Art Rosenbaum and his influence on Kent's practice as a graduate student at the University of Georgia and today. We are also discussing Rosenbaum in a broader context of regional and international art movements in figurative painting. Um, first, I'd like to ask you um, to talk about paintings by Rosenbaum that resonated, resonated with you as a student and today as a mid-career artist. Certainly. Uh, and hey, Lee, thanks for having me. Um, and it's, it's great to, to be able to speak with everyone. Um, I, I work on Zoom all the time, by the way, uh, as a teacher. Um, but the webinar format's a little different. So I can't see you, unfortunately. Uh, but hopefully you can see me and you can all hear me. And then um, I think if you have questions, um, I don't know, Lee, if they're able to, to uh, utilize the chat. Yes, there's, there's chat here, so we can use chat. Yes. Okay, cool. So I'll try to keep an eye on that chat. Uh, if any questions uh, come up, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, but I just want to thank Lee for giving me this opportunity because I, uh, you know, it's kind of exciting um, to have studied with Rosenbaum uh, and to, you know, to kind of seen his work change over the years. Uh, and of course, mine as well, you know, but what's really fun is I, I knew him as, uh, as my professor at uh, University of Georgia. Uh, I was there from 2000 and gosh, what was it? 2003 to 2006. Uh, it's a three year program, by the way. <laughs> I didn't take my time on that. It was, uh, it was kind of designed that way. Uh, and one of the great things about it was that we did get a chance to teach along with, um, with our studies. And so, you know, when I think about Art Rosenbaum, he was really the first person uh, that I got to meet. So um, I don't know if you all are familiar with the grad program uh, at Georgia. Uh, it's, it's pretty exclusive, if I do say so myself. Uh, and they have some, they have wonderful scholarship op opportunities and things. So of course I was gunning for, for a scholarship and um, I happened to be in the area and, and Art Rosenbaum uh, reached out to me, you know, after I had applied and said, hey, you want to come check the place out? And I said, of course, you know, and, uh, and I don't know if I was expecting to actually uh, get to meet with Professor Rosenbaum personally. Uh, I thought, you know, I might have, I might have an administrative assistant, you know, kind of say, hey, that's the art building over there. Uh, but it was quite a different story. Um, I met with, uh, with art directly and, you um, and that kind of blew me away because I'd, I'd seen his stuff and I'd heard about him um, and I wasn't quite prepared uh, to, <laughs> to actually be sitting in his office. And he had an, uh, an awesome office, by the way. I mean, you know, it's, it's almost like if, um, if a set designer from a film had said, hey, we need, a, we need an art professor office, you know, and you make it, you know, and it's like you had the skeleton there and then you had, uh, you know, lots of books, of course, a uh, brilliant man, uh, art is. Um, there were, uh, I remember there was a great Pontormo poster on the wall and Pontormo, uh, you know, was this Italian mannerist and he's my favorite or one of my favorites. And so I remember like sitting down in that, in that dusty chair and thinking, oh man, I'm in the right place, you know? Um, so Rosenbaum, of course, uh, delivered, right? Like, like he took me around and it was a fantastic experience. And every now and then, you know, you get just this great feeling. Uh, you get this feeling like, yeah, this is, you know, this is where I belong. And so I almost immediately had that uh, with art. And uh, it was such a pleasure. So over the years, I got to kind of learn more about him and work with him. But that poster with the with Pantarmo and that mannerist uh, style really stuck with me because I think that's something that art uh, does very well is he brings uh, a lyrical quality. That's a good word. To painting. You know, like especially the figures, right? And the mannerists, as you all probably know, um, were post Renaissance, and so by then they'd kind of figured out how the body worked. You know, they knew they knew all that stuff, and they were kind of like, "Yeah, what do we do now?" And so, you know, using the figure as a vehicle to kind of extend um, 
kind of the emotive quality of the human body, uh, I thought was right on. So Rosenbaum's painting, I don't know if I can pick one or two. Um, I have I have some images that I collected. And Lee, would you be careful, comfortable with me sharing those? Oh, yes, yes. I'd love to see them. Okay, cool. Well, here, I'm going to switch uh, and share screens real quick. Um, uh, hey, Robert. I see Robert in the chat room. So good to see you. Um, been way too long. I gotta, I gotta make my way back up the to your neck of the woods. Yeah, Rachel Straw's dream. That's one of our favorites in the exhibit. Yeah, that's and and I thought, you know, I was thinking, which one should I talk about? And it's like, well, this one, this one kind of does all the talking. So I think this is, this is kind of a quintessential Rosenbaum, right? And and what I think a lot of people don't get right off is just how complex his compositions are. Uh, and it's one thing to say, hey, I'm gonna have, you know, six figures in a painting like that's enough you know that that in and of itself is enough um but to be able to direct the viewer's eye you know from one spot to the next and to maintain a focal point you know and to do all of that you know is not just a matter of scale or contrast but you have to deal with temperature and color right like you can't have everything hot at once because the viewer is not going to know where to to look and then you know, anytime there are any symbols um, or text, right, that that triggers something else in the human eye that says, oh, I need to read this first, or oh, I need to pay attention to this object first. Uh, and I know I'm probably talking to, to some art people out there, so I don't mean to simplify things. But to be able to orchestrate a multi-figure, multi-surface giant canvas is no easy feat. And I think one of the best takeaways I had from working with Rosenbaum is that it, they would sneak up on you. The paintings would sneak up on you. So you would, you'd say, oh yeah, that painting with the, you know, the guy grabbing the guitar in the water. And it's like somebody else would say, no, no, it's that, that painting with that shirtless guy, you know, holding that, that figure. And it's like, no, no, it's not. It's the one with the window, you know? And so people, there'd be such an oversaturation of information, but yet it would be so well composed that that it was like, um, I would liken it to a really good film. And you, you don't just experience the film and then walk away. You know, it, it kind of haunts you. And maybe two days later, you're still thinking about it. Um, that for me has always been the strength of Rosenbaum's work is that it resonates with you, you know? And, uh, and I think this painting is no exception. <laughs> Another thing I, I, I got from, from Rosenbaum, not just color, um, oops, sorry. Ooh, sorry, <laughs> but um, but his ability to draw because he did this equally, you know, well, just with limited palette or or limited materials. And so, um, one thing I really appreciated about his work is he would oscillate between these these grand paintings and these drawings. Uh, and this might be Conte crayon, maybe I don't know. Um, but to be able to maintain that type of focus still with these complex composition, I always, I always pulled something from that. So I really like that he kind of gave all of his students this green light um, to be ambitious with what they do, but then to also, you know, just jump around with media and, 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 and see what comes out of that exploration. Mm -hmm. um, and Rosenbaum, you know, he was kind of a, a pretty intense character. I don't know how many of you have had the chance to um, hang out with him. Uh, and he's still very, has a very vigorous, you know, studio practice just as, you know, 15 years ago when I knew him. Um, but, you know, he was kind of an intimidating figure in a way. <laughs> like he, uh, um, you know, he was extremely accomplished. So even before you worked with him, you were a little bit hesitant, but he, but he was quiet about his accomplishments. And, and you don't often meet somebody um, who's very humble about what they do. And he never kind of wore it up front. It's like the, the more you had the chance to talk with him, you started to say, oh, oh, you speak French? Like, oh, okay. And, you know, oh, in another language? Like, okay. And then what do you mean you just got a Grammy? You know, like, like <laughs> all of those things. It's like, wait, wait, wait a second. What, you know? Um, he was always uh, very interesting. You know, some of my, my peers, I regret I never had the courage to take part in the, uh, um, the sea shanties that he would host, you know, at the globe. Um, I was kind of in that group, you know, <laughs> but 
but I think just overall, you know, his his kind of his love for 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 just everything that was going on, and he was able to to get. He's still able. I'm sorry uh, to give his energy to all of these different things, you know. So he'll 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 pull out, you know, some music, or he'll um, or he'll tell you about these great days, you know, in in New York and the, his art collection, and it's just like. I don't know. He sets the bar very high. <laughs> what do you What do you feel about the legacy of figurative painting at UGA? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, it, you know, we're, it's really a great time to be an artist right now. I think it's probably a great time to be an anything right now. Um, but you know, when we a lot of a lot of the instruction that we've had up till now, you know, and and, and granted, we're living in a post postmodern arts climate. Um, but I think a lot of uh, a lot of um, people's concepts about artists stems from modernism, you know, where you would have people hanging out together, you know, writing manifestos, talking about, uh, you know, what they wanted to accomplish as a group, you know, in making art, um, and that that is kind of splintered, you know, in recent times. Um, because people are, we're globally connected now, but even so, you're seeing a form of that. Like, let's take Instagram, for example. You're seeing a form of how, um, you know, either the algorithm or just your personal interests, um, you start to curate what you want to be surrounded with. And that's, that's not unlike, for me, finding a, a solid group of artists, you know, to, to smoke cigarettes with and drink coffee and, and, and you know, talk about, you know, conceptual um, development, right? So, so what we have now is a version of that, but it is, it's around the world. So I could be, I could be looking at an amazing painter from Switzerland and seeing similarities. And I know there's a term for this and I, I and maybe someone out there can, um, can plop it in the chat room, you know, like you see this in film and you see this in scientific discoveries and pretty much everything where there's something out there in the ether and there are multiple people addressing it, you know, and they, and it feels like it's of the moment, but yet it's shared. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there's a great term for that. It's like synchronous, you know, discovery or something like that. Um, but also you don't want to deny uh, the potency of, of kind of regional influence and whether you're going to a place specifically to, you know, to study with someone or to be in a certain geographical location that that you intend to have influence you in some way. Um, but what I'm more interested in is in the things that kind of creep out from from under the floorboards, you know. Mm -hmm. And I can say, at least during my time at Georgia, there was uh, uh, a slant toward figurative work, and I don't mean it was orchestrated. I mean it just kind of it just kind of happened. And it was fascinating because I remember, um, you know, we had Art Rosenbaum, of course, uh, and then we had Scott Belleville, also a figurative painter. Um, then you had uh, Jim Herbert, who who was an abstract figurative painter, and that guy was interesting too because you know he he painted in the nude, and they'd be like these twelve foot paintings that he'd be using as you know he'd be doing hand painting with. I mean, pretty amazing time. But a lot of it, a lot of it was all about this physicality. And I don't know, you know, if you look at time and history, you can, especially in retrospect, you can start to see a correlation between how artists are behaving based upon technology or just whatever's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and things were getting kind of slick in the early 2000s. You know, we had uh, smartphones and, you know, giant screen TVs. And, um, and I think there was a real nod to acknowledging the human body you know for whatever for, and for whatever and, and for the area that I was in and with the people I was with around it was it came in the form of figuration right right synchronicity I'll take it yeah, yeah, so yeah. uh so that you know so there's and what I love you know I love the south I love being an artist in the south um a because I still feel like the rest of the world doesn't quite understand what's going on here. <laughs> you know, like there's, there's that Southern mystique 
Um, but there's also something, and you, and this could be said true of other places, but there is something very elemental about certain parts of the world, you know, and maybe it's, it's an oppressive heat. Uh, maybe it's a landscape, maybe it's the, the hum of cicadas. <laughs> like, I don't know, but there's something, there's something really grand about the South. Um, <laughs> and I think it's probably going to be, uh, you know, a, a perpetual, um, perpetually misunderstood, you know, because, you know, politics aside, I think there's something, there's something about the region. And when I say South, I think, you know, anything, you know, South of DC, right, right. And North <clears throat> of Cuba. <laughs> so, um, yeah, excellent. So Ken, uh, what a, can you talk about a few of your works and how they intersect with Rosenbaum? Sure. Yeah. Um, and I, I have a shot here. Uh, so, you know, one of the things I kind of took from Rosenbaum um, was this, this unabashed, like, uh, kind of ribbon-like quality to the figure, you know, the, the ability to kind of twist them, um, you know, have them fit within a form, have them respond to environments. Uh, and so a lot of the paintings I did, and, and again, it's, it didn't hit me exactly when I was there, you know, and I don't know how you all operate, but for me, it takes a while for things to kind of resonate and sink in. So I was part of this experience. Uh, and, it, you know, it's a lot like you're, you're discovering things about yourself, you're figuring out things with paint. Uh, and so it was shortly out of graduate school that I started to, to see those influences pop up. Uh, and that came in primarily the way the figure was distorted intentionally, um, but also there was this sense of pattern and mm -hmm. ornament, you know? And both of you seem to have the pat like clothing. You do a really good rendition of clothing. And it's, and yeah. Well, and, it, and again, you know, you go back to that first image of, of you know, what a curveball, you know, because you've got patterns on the tie, but then you also have the pattern of the water, and then you have the reflections on the glass and the, you know, the rocks, you know, accumulating and the wrinkles in the fabric. So, so all of those things are, are like a great challenge, you know, it's like, it's like you want to give, you give a chef 15 ingredients, and you say, no, you can't just pick three, you got to use all of them. But if you overpower us, you know, with with flavor, you failed. <laughs> you know, so so I kind of see Rosenbaum's paintings as, as like up in the ante, you know. And there's nothing wrong with with quiet or minimal work. Like that has its place for sure. But one thing I always loved about Rosenbaum is that there was this unabashed, you know, no, you know, you have to have a strong stomach to to engage in, in that type of activity. So while my stuff's no, 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 nowhere near as complex as his, you know, I always felt that his work was kind of this, um, a visual representation of the complexity of his mind, you know, to be able to go from French to music, to, to teaching, to painting, right? So you see that, you see the equivalent of that in the visuals that he created. Um, and so of course I, I attempted, you know, <laughs> and I'm still attempting, uh, to kind of marry these um, interesting narratives that are um, somewhat mysterious. Like, sure, in his painting, there's, you know, there's music going on, but there's also something else going on. You know, there's like young romance, and then there's man and nature, and, you know, you, there's a sense of God in there, you know? So, um, so I wanted, I, I remember wanting to say, all right, I'm going to make some big surfaces, and I'm going to try to make them as complex as I can. Um, but I wasn't very good at gravity. So I ended up, uh, I ended up putting a lot of paintings underwater so that, so that if the gravity wasn't quite, you know, what, what Rosenbaum would do, at least I had this, this kind of, you know, life preserver, pun intended, uh, to kind of keep me, keep me composing without having to, to deal with gravity. But it was fun being a student too. I mean, it was, you know, it was a wild ride and I recommend grad school to anybody. So um, let's see some paintings and then uh, so can you share it on the screen? Let's see. And also the, uh, uh, we're talking about paintings that define the traje trajectory of your career also that they kind of came from Rosenbaum. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of, you know, uh, and I'm a horrible documenter, you know, and I, I hope I don't have too many students watching right now, but you know, I, and this might be just the age of Instagram, but the minute I finish something, 
I'll whip out the phone and I'll take a picture of it and I'll say, Hey buddy, look, you know, yeah, no. uh, and I don't take the time to like, you know, professionally photograph them. So, uh, and nothing could be more true than my days as a graduate student. So, you know, I have a lot of images that I created, but, you know, and people have to realize how fast, you know, things have evolved. Like when I applied to graduate school in the early 2000s, we were still using slides. So, so my portfolio to get into UGA was a sheet of 20, you know, slides. And that's just wild to think about, you know? Um, yes. I'm sorry, I, I, I may have changed the screen. We're seeing uh, 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 one of your uh, water pit pieces now. Yeah, so I'm sharing screen and I think everybody should be able to see that as well. Um, do you need me to stop sharing for a minute? No, keep Lee? sharing, keep sharing. But okay. So, um, so yeah, so I've been, I've been throwing my slideshow up here, but, um, you know, this was a pretty big one for me. This one, you know, this one kind of, I started realizing that, that I wanted these very powerful girls, um, you know, kind of navigating space. And, and this was the very first one, but they, they increasingly became, um, like in this, this state of danger. There was this sense of peril, um, and it was it was something that kind of surprised me. Um, and I have other images I could show you, but like there would be a painting of a girl uh, climbing up a tree and sawing off the branches as she made her way up, you know. And I was thinking, wow, that's a very self destructive um, thing, you know. But but unlike Rosenbaum, I could only focus on one kind of protagonist, if you will. Like I, I would often have a figure and the, and the entire narrative would anchor around that figure. And I always marveled at his paintings because he was able to do multiple things within a painting yet still maintain a focal point, which is not easy, right? Um, and in a way, you know, his paintings remind me of like, a, like an old, like Giotto, you know, sequential fresco where like you're seeing one thing happen and then you're seeing another and another but you're you're experiencing it all at once and i think it's a real testament to not only his his way of designing surfaces but also to our 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 neuroplasticity our our ability as a human race to to kind of develop and pro, pro, process information multiple bits of information all at once so in, in that way, I think he's kind of ahead of his time because you know, it's like you have to catch up to him, <laughs> not the so, other way around. It's a, so this one particular piece was on our show, uh, Art House in, it's on City Square in uh, downtown Williamsburg, uh, we, a collaboration with the city in 2013. And this was the year after we did Substrata with Tyrus Litton. So I'm, I'm kind of talking about these. So this, you, I saw this process going on. I saw you changed it in different ways. I really think that's exciting when you're changing something as you go and you're using your cell phone and you show me a, one version and it comes changes to another version and it kind of evolved into this one. Uh, can you discuss this one a little bit? Sure. So, you know what? So a lot of people will see a painting of mine. And, and again, I can't speak about Rosenbaum's work because I, I think even if he explained to us what he was doing, it'd still be a mystery, you know? <laughs> but, um, but a lot of people say, oh yeah, you know, you decided to paint a painting of a person, uh, you know, holding a sea urchin surrounded by an octopus, but nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, the narrative always takes a back seat, uh, and it's even un it's not even acknowledged or even thought out until there there's a design. And so, what this really started out as is just a series of lines that kind of overlap and collide until a form starts to present itself, and then when it does. Uh, then I, I have the wonderful privilege of figuring out how to nurture that idea and still make sure it works somewhat logically in a composition. Mm -hmm. uh, and to be honest, the, the, un, the first underwater painting I ever did was, was because I had a figure that looked like they were floating, but I couldn't figure out why. I didn't want them to just kind of be floating, although I let myself do that later. <laughs> I'm sorry, I do have a Boston Terrier, by the way, who is the loudest <laughs> snorer I've ever heard. So if you hear this weird, like. Um, well, I definitely, definitely see the, you know, the, you have the angle, different angles. And as far as Rosenbaum, you have, 
you're, you're both working with, you know, your masters of color and, and you know, dynamic movement. Uh, well, I appreciate that, you know, um, and when I see his paintings, I think music, you know, like I think about, and I, I don't, I don't write music, but I know that there has to be like a crescendo and then there has to be, you know, some rhythm that occurs over and over and then there's some kind of refrain or, again, I don't know music terms, but when I see his work, I think music. Um, and I would love for people to, you know, kind of have that feeling in my work too. Uh, well, it's almost like it's a, it's a kind of a music, a more different sort of music uh, with your work. So. Yeah, I wonder what it would be, you know. I'm hoping for Berlioz, but I'll take, <laughs> I'll take Willie Nelson, you know. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. So, oh. so, yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, what are some other milestone works for your career? So, well, you know, they're, they're still coming along. Um, I did, there is one painting, um, and I couldn't find it, regrettably. I couldn't find an image, because like I said, I'm a horrible uh, documenter. But I did a painting once of, um, when I was in graduate school, that's when we had Hurricane Katrina. And I had, uh, for whatever reason, I had a very, uh, just a profound um, emotional response to that. I remember I saw, uh, it was footage and I remember just thinking, you know, like, like, how come nothing's happening? Like what, you know, like this is America, like what's going on? Uh, and I remember there was a, there was a gentleman, a victim of the flood who had, uh, did not know how to swim. And so he had fastened these two, you know, those giant kind of igloo coolers that, um, that have like a spout at the bottom mm -hmm. and you see them at like football games and things. Well, this particular gentleman did not know how to swim. And so he had fastened two of those to his arms, like giant floaties. Yeah, that was a large painting, correct? That was a very large one. That was a very large painting. Yeah. And in fact, um, so I was painting that, I, I was in graduate school when that was happening. And, um, and I just remember what an impact that had and I didn't know how to handle it. So I was whacking away at these two canvases. It was a diptych or just a two-part canvas, really. I guess you could call it a diptych, but it was really because I couldn't make them any bigger. So I just put two big ones together and I was struggling with this thing and it just wasn't happening. And, you know, it's one of those things you hear about in, in books, you know, it's like one of the paintings fell over for whatever reason, maybe I was throwing things at it. It wasn't happening, you know, it just wasn't, it wasn't coming together. And, uh, and so I went there, I went there to put it back up and I said, well, what if I put it on the other side, you know? So it was doing this, this one fell over. And as I was picking it up, I ended up putting it here. And then the painting just came together. And it was a really interesting moment because before I had, imagine if you will, and it's about the size of, the, of this you know, box that you're looking at here where I'm talking. But I had two figures and one was like on a little chunk of land here and one was on a little chunk of land over here. And between them was this great expanse and it was New Orleans and houses were covered in water you know, in fact, you could only see their rooftops. Uh, and there was like an old, you know, a highway that had collapsed. And anyway, what happened is when I switched them, those two little land masses there became an island. Mm -hmm. And suddenly all the activity was happening around this little patch of dry land. And the painting just came together, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't until later that I realized that Rosenbaum had a similar thing. Oh, going. yes, yes. Yeah, I was and, this, and I was like, I was there the whole time. You know, so, so I owe Rosenbaum some royalties on that painting because I didn't realize it until later that I had kind of, uh, or maybe he maybe he copied me. I can't recall. What is the data? <laughs> you just, never know. just kidding. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. and it's the, like, wow, rooftops, you know, like, yeah. man. But the, this is the deluge, and this is in a private collection here in Virginia. It was, it's funny. My painting was called The Flood. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> I got to find that painting. Um, and I'll look for it, but, uh, but yeah, so that, that was kind of one of those turning points, you know, where you, it's like, you, you don't realize that you're sharing ideas or maybe borrowing. I dare I say see, not stealing. The one of the, the other one of the girl with the, the water, you just, the other one, right. Uh, that was also in the show at, at Art House on City Square. I, I love the, the angles of the water in this one and the reflection. Is that very difficult for you to do these reflections or kind of? Uh, well, you know, it's it's not. I mean, because you know we're we're already dealing with non-reality, right? Like like that's one thing I 
I enjoy about my work is that I, I'm not beholden to reality, so to speak, because I don't use references. And I think these weird kind of lobster creatures are kind of a testament to that. You know, like I, I start out with something like, eh, maybe it'll be a jellyfish and then it becomes something else. And But that maneuverability allows for, of course, gross human distortion, but it also allows the design to come first. So, you know, if, and what's interesting about this painting is that it's, um, this type of view, we understand it, right? Like we see the cross section of, of water, like interior, exterior, you know, we see the surface, we see below the surface. That wasn't available to us until film and cinematography or, or photography came around. So we can see this now and we can say, oh yeah, that's just a cross section. But outside of maybe scientific illustration, people wouldn't understand like, well, why is, they'd say, why is that weird triangle of foam, you know, floating above the water? Like, you know, something we have to consider is that we are always being conditioned by commercials and film and music <laughs> to interpret space. And when a new, a new image comes along after that wears off, it just becomes part of our, our, our you know, communal understanding of, of space. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of fun, but you know what? I also with Rosenbaum, it's like, I started appreciating drawing too. So, so instead of putting all this pressure on yourself to paint and, and make this painting, you know, this, this perfect, this masterpiece, it's like, I ah, just do some drawings, you know? So, uh, I really responded to that. Now I, I prefer ballpoint pen over Conte, you know, um, but the difference may be is that I never really expect people to look at the ballpoint pen drawings. They're more of a, an ideation tool. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, you, you see a, a Rosenbaum Conte crayon and you're like, how much, you know, like, like you see it and you want it. Uh, and I think even, uh, even at the, at the globe in Athens, you know, where the sea shanties take place. I think if I recall, there's this beautiful frame drawing by Rosenbaum, you know, kind of over the bar, uh, and it gets more and more interesting with each beer you drink. Just kidding. <laughs> but it's a great drawing, you know. Um, so I remember taking drawing from him as well and really, really kind of responding to that. But, you know, there's there are other influences, too. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm following um, art, um, art around. <laughs> right, right. So um, what other artists excite you? I mean, uh, what are, these days? Yeah, well, you know, like I said, it's it's great to be part of of social media because you see stuff coming down the line and it's simultaneously exciting, but then it's also a little intimidating because you see somebody working on something, you're like, oh man, like, man, I gotta take it up a notch, you know? Um, one artist I really like, uh, he's actually, a, he's an illustrator who's now found a, a lot of comfort in, in the more fine arts world. And, and they're, kind of, they're kind of together anyway. Um, but I think he started out more sequential kind of illustration. Um, and that's this guy, Aaron uh, Weisenfeld. And, you know, it's kind of fun because like you can send them messages, like, like you find painters that you like and you can kind of communicate with them. And sometimes they're really cool. Like Aaron's really, you know, he'll, he'll sh shoot messages back to me. And, but it's, it's lovely to watch him develop. But one of the reasons he's my favorites uh, and we're about the same age, which is always fun. Um, but his his work, of course, is dealing with the figure. But his figures are, they a lot of them feel like adolescence. And he kind of touches on those moments when you're younger and things are just magical. Like there's a giant rainstorm, you know, and, and there's some giant drainage pipe, you know, spilling out into the quarry, you know, and there's like this, this holiness almost to it. Um, they're often by themselves, not always, um, but his environments are just superb. I mean, there's a painting of, uh, he did of, of like a girl kind of playing the flute right by a lakeside or something. Uh, and you, it's like, oh man, she's conjuring some monster out of there or something, or maybe she's just finding a place to practice, you know? Um, oh, I'm sorry. We got, what's going on? I'm just checking out the chat. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, I agree, uh, Robert. Oh, here we have something in the Q&A. Cool. I really admire your inter 
interpretation of the human form, your figures have varying levels of distortion and proportions. How do you make those choices and what is the process there? Um, I'm going to answer live if that's cool, Brian. Uh, you know, I like the, um, I like the figures to kind of, uh, it's like you want to breathe life into your figures. And I think some, some artists are so intent on anatomical accuracy that even if the human figure they're painting definitely looks human, like you can tell exactly how old they are and exactly what time of day um, they're being depicted in. Um, but sometimes it can get a little clunky, you know, and I see a lot of artists fall into that trap where, where they almost choke the life out of their, their figures because they're so, they're so highly rendered that they end up becoming, you know, stiff or, or lifeless. Uh, so, you know, I'll, I'll let things just kind of fly around. Like I remember putting, I couldn't decide on, on which head I wanted to put on a figure. So I just, I put them both on there. I just kind of let them, you know, like one head kind of sit behind the other. Uh, and that can be an interesting, that can be interesting territory because at one point people say, well, you know, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. But on the other hand, it's like, if you're starting a figure from scratch, or at least from, from what you remember about the anatomy, um, it's just like you're, it's just like a signature. Like if everybody did that, they would have their own versions of these little humans walking around. Um, so I, I kind of give myself permission to bend and twist and do whatever. Sometimes it's a little unnerving. I remember one of my first figurative paintings. Um, I was in, I was in college at Savannah College of Art and Design. Uh, that's where I did my bachelor's, and there was this beautiful girl that, and I was, I think I was trying to hit on her. Her name was Ratch. I don't know what her full name was, but um, kind of exotic, kind of long. And I remember convincing her to let me paint her in this weird velvet chair, you know, that I had at, at my apartment and. Uh, I know we're keeping it PG-13, but anyway, I painted Ratch in the chair and she had this gesture like with her hand, like she was doing something cool like this, but for whatever reason, her arm looked like it was made out of rubber. And, hmm. and I tried painting it and, and right and it just didn't look, and so I just said, you know what, let's just give her a rubber arm. So I just kind of went, Bleh, you know, and she kind of looks like Elastigirl from, you know, from, uh, What's that? What's that? The Incredibles, yeah. But um, anyway, you know, I, I like letting the figure do the movement because I think figurative painters are in a really interesting spot right now. And I was having this conversation with a student about portraiture. But now, you know, if it's about accuracy, we've got plenty of technology for that. Um, and, and so painters kind of have to find their place in the, in the grand scheme of, of figuration. And I think Aaron Weisenfeld is a great example of that. Um, I also, you know, one of my tried and trues, Thomas Hart Benton, I'm sorry about the pixelated image. Um, I think he's got a lot of what Rosenbaum's go, got going mm -hmm. for him. You know, you've got this overall kind of lyrical movement. It's almost like a roller coaster. Like you, you know, you jump in, in the guitar and you hope you, you know, you hope you live to see the steamboat, you know, like you just kind of, you kind of roll through this thing, like, like in a barrel going over, you know, Niagara Falls. <laughs> it's just, it's a real trip, you know? Um, so he's definitely an influence, although he's not around, you know, very much. I still find, I still find myself, you know, painting truncated trees and things. So just something about, about the, the way he makes stuff is pretty amazing. And then, you know, if we're going to go a little bit more local, um, you know, I love Miles work. I know, I know he's with you uh, Miles, Miles Cleveland Goodwin. Um, this was from the show uh, that the just ended a couple months ago here at the gallery uh, uh, from the spirit. Uh, this reminded me a bit of your uh, paintings of moths and kind of it. Well, and yeah, also reminded know, me of the one, the pyramid you did. And it, was that about Katrina too? Uh, he's, it was. he's really dark and he's, uh, and we really like his work. It's kind of this figurative, we call it, well, art called it allegorical figurative painting. And I think all of you guys do that. And it's really strong with our collectors at the gallery and, and our, our, our patrons. So um, what do you think of Maya? Give us a, a little bit of your take on Maya. Well, you know, I remember when, when I first started seeing his stuff come across your Instagram page, you know, and I was like, whoa, like, who, you know, like, because there's something, I think, I think with every painter, there's a little bit of shaman in there, you know, like there's this idea of, of conjuring something 
perhaps it didn't exist at all and to make something out of nothing or or to be inspired by something and and go through the process of mimicking it to your best abilities uh but i think it's primarily palette and the three-dimensional quality of miles work that that it just gets me just about every time you know and and it reminds me a little bit of a, an artist named Albert Pinkham Ryder. And he was, you know, his paintings have kind of disintegrated because I think he was playing around with materials and they're like super cracked now. Um, I'm sorry. Um, I got to pick up my, my kids from the bus in about 10 minutes. I got to warn you. I'm so sorry about yeah. that. Uh, but, um, but there's like, it's like you're looking at, at it like a soul. You know? like, right, right. Like, like the landscapes there but then it's also feels very internal and and it's like those things that that you feel are kind of move you um it's the sublime you know you can't quite put your finger on it but you see it a mile away and it just it just kind of reverberates in your yeah that kind of goes back to what jeff mazy said about seeing it from a distance and then it pulls you and grabs you like your work does that i think art does you know, a lot of the art that i like pulls you grabs you your yeah, spirit. and I don't know exactly how to define that, you know, because there are different attractants, you know, you know, like, oh, I love that color, like, that's fine, you know, you can, you can be yanked around by color, uh, or just the subject matter, or even the scale, but when you see something like this, you know, you start to wonder, like, okay, he made that decision to do this, you know, and that almost over there almost feels like it's completely accidental, but I'm so glad it's there, because now this thing here works with that, and, and so, to be able to construct something and and almost be a slave to your intuition where you just allow yourself to do it and then when you do it's like people people sense it and and maybe you're doing something that they they can't do or they don't allow themselves to do but i think miles work is really is really demonstrates that you know it's like pure gut it's just it's just great gut and mm -hmm. and and you know unapologetic and he doesn't try to say, oh, look, I can do this too. Like if I wanted to, I could, you know, paint this pearl. I mean, that's a, that's a trap a lot of artists fall into. Right, right. You know, uh, they have to show you. Right, right. So you have a show coming up in the Netherlands. Hey, you were talking. Yeah, it's kind of cool. And, and I need to thank you for that, Lee, because, um, you know, the presence you've, you've, you've given your artists on Artsy, I think that's actually how this gallery discovered me. So, um, so he, uh, yeah, I, I got a call, you know, a while back, um, uh, the Morin, Morin Gallery in, um, in the Netherlands in Utrecht, um, figurative work, you know, and they, they saw some of my stuff and, and said, hey, you know, can we, uh, would you be interested in working with us? And I said, well, of course, you know, and, and so I want to thank you because that, that kind of happened as a result of, of your uh, representing me. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of cool. It's just starting out. Um, you know, some logistical things, you know what, he likes these large paintings, like five, six footers, and that can be extremely pricey just to send over to the Netherlands. So uh, I'm currently working on unstretched canvas um, and just putting them in a tube and, and sending them over there. But, you know, it's one of the great benefits is we, we can be seen as artists from anybody, by anybody in the world. Well, Artsy is very good with that. I mean, we've been with him for over three years now, and I it really kind of brings that together, the collector culture with the artists and, and you know, that dialogue with everybody internationally. Really, it's really intriguing and really inspiring for us. Um, so you have some work in a show coming up here in the summer. Are you working on for us as well? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I have pictures here. Let me see. Oh, yeah, that was from Substrata. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I'm not working on this. Uh, yeah, I got some things in the works, you know. One thing I liked about Rosenbaum is, uh, and he would draw his students too. And I know there's somewhere there exists this beautiful drawing of me. Um, and I think I had a beard at the time. Uh, and I had this horrible tattoo on my shoulder. And, and he was like, oh, why don't you roll up your sleeve? And so I'm like, yeah, okay. You know, so, so I think the drawing ended up, you know, making me look um, a lot more stronger than I am. But Rosenbaum was always working on multiple surfaces. And so um, I kind of adopted that practice from him as well. So this shot kind of shows what the studio looks like, where you know there's something half painted or about to be destroyed, and then something that's just getting started. Um, 
but yeah, I've got a few few things. Uh, the one I'm most excited about is is our summer project. I know we're still working out the kinks on on a title, although I like the one <laughs> the one we're working on. But I don't know if that can be revealed yet. Um, um, but yeah, I'm working on. Uh, you know, I think I got one in here. Uh, you know, I've, I'm starting to have these. Again, it's always going to be the figure, but but I'm kind of taking a cue from. Um, from Rosenbaum and, and Weisenfeld. Uh, sounds like a play, doesn't it? <laughs> Rosenbaum and Weisenfeld. Uh, where I'm trying to incorporate more of the environment into the figure. So it's not just a figure in a place, but like you're getting a sense of heat or maybe a, a, you know, a cool November landscape. Uh, so something like this is in progress where you have what, in, what eventually will be fall leaves kind of gathering around this figure. Um, or uh, this is one I, I finished recently where, you know, I'm really pushing the more sculptural textural quality of it. Uh, but then finding like this quiet moment, you know, of, uh, you know, this figure just kind of hovering in space. And it's not like stuff that, that you've sold through the gallery, like Alto, right, was, was kind of a precursor to this one, um, where you have these, you know, this idea of, of easily not being grounded. And just kind of getting lost, you know, whether it's in thought or or just checking out, you know. I think a lot of us have experienced that over the last you know, year. That was a strong one. We can send people can talk about that, and we can send them images of that if they like later on. Oh yeah, yeah. I really love that painting too, and I'm glad. I think that found a collector, or that went somewhere. But um, but that painting, you know, it's it's funny how things kind of circle back. You know, like that painting was done a while a while ago. And here I am painting this figure floating again. <laughs> right, right. So, um, <laughs> so, so is there anything else you'd like to add about Rosenbaum or what you're working on? We're running out of time here. Sure. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I don't want, I don't want to leave my kids hanging. Um, yeah, you know what? I, I've always appreciated the narrative quality of Rosenbaum stuff, even if you're not quite sure exactly what the narrative is. Uh, so like a lot of other artists, I had trouble producing during quarantine. I don't know if anybody out there listening had that experience as well, because you'd think, oh, well, I'm at home, you know, I'm going to make like nobody's business. Um, but I kind of shut down a little bit. But so the creativity kind of found its way out in another in another way. So I'm uh, I'm actually working on a kid's book. <laughs> I did one actually when I was in graduate school. Um, you know, Rosenbaum was was really, you know, ambitious and would say take on a project you know yeah do that and so I actually published my first book uh, when I was in graduate school uh, working with Rosenbaum so for whatever reason that kind of came back around um, I am pushing digital painting now I'm trying to explore that a little bit so uh, this is one of the illustrations again a, a little bit different um, this one's called in the kingdom of toads and uh, basically a, a girl is being mean to animals and she gets shrunk down and has to live with them <laughs> I really love the cat in the background. It's almost like a tree, and it's also a cat or a bush. And it's, you know, I'm saying it's kind of yeah. Thank you. Yeah, but that's kind of like um, you know, I write horror scripts with my brother, so you know, like mapping out a story and everything is is a lot of fun, and and that's more of a pure illustrative narrative, you know, going on. But that one's almost done, and I I have, I'm shopping around for agents and and a publisher right now. But uh, I've been having a blast. So that's kind of what I'm working on. I got stuff for for you and I, maybe in the summer. Um, and then, you know, I got to get some paintings to the Netherlands. So life's good. I can't complain. Yeah. So, so, so I, it's very insightful and we appreciated everything. And um, yeah, the, this discussion, I think is, does anybody have any quick questions at the end or I guess we're, that's, you know, I guess it's a wrap or almost, almost a wrap. So, yeah. <laughs> um, well, if, if you do, you know, I'm sure, um, send them to the gallery would it be info at, at linda manny gallery or should it be uh, curator curator at linda manny gallery.com and we'll answer your questions and if we'll send some images of some of the works you didn't see here that he we mentioned today as well so anyway we really thank you for coming and we'll uh, see you again soon uh, we'll probably have some other zoom meetings coming up uh, awesome thank you lee and thank you everyone for joining us i really appreciate it